Welcome to Manwa Dragon. It is actually a romance novel about a dimension jumping heroine named Lena, who falls into another world and it's showered with love by the primary and secondary male characters. The villains of the story are Rush Burke and Callis Hannitan. The one who suffers a very horrible death is none other than the woman whose body possesses is Syria Stern. Syria inherited the power of the gods and was granted the title Stern. She might have been the most holy being in the empire, but that did not stop her from committing depravities as if she had some sort of fetish for being wicked. If you ask 100 people what they thought of her, 150 would describe her as a high society troublemaker. Her pastime was extravagance, her speciality, dissipation. Even her relationship with her family was atrocious. As for me, I was just a normal college student. From the moment I realized I was now in Syria's body, I have only been thinking one thing, I don't want to freaking die. Of all characters, why Syria? I don't want to die. I did already met an untimely demise in my last time. So I did not want to die in vain again this time around. Before Lena, the main character shows up, I gotta find some way to get rid of all of Syria's enemies. I faced a lonely uphill struggle trying to change the Syria's reputation Syria was sitting in the terrace and was watching his love Callus who was dating with Lena in the garden. Syria's caretaker was also standing in the terrace enjoying cold breeze of winter. She said the future of the emperor is already looking bright. A saint descended from the heavens. Is not this a blessing from above? Suddenly she noticed Lena in the garden and asked, but who is that beside her? Oh, is that not your intended Lady Syria? Furthermore, she told her, it's looked like the two of them have already become close, how envious. Syria stern with emerald hair, clench her fist adorned with a glowing ring, her eyes blazing with determination. Callus, you punk, our wedding is only a week away. I could march down there and rip all his hair out right now, but there are a lot of eyes on me I've got to restrain myself. Syria changed her mood, and being laughing she told her, my fiancé is such a social creature haha. -ha. After laughing, as Syria was not feeling well due to cold, she started coughing. Her caretaker got worried. Oh my lady, you have to recover from your cold, my lady? Later this evening, I will prepare you some more medicines. Syria coughing said it appears you will be out on the terrace with your patient all day in the grand hall of the ancient castle lady syria with her emerald hair cascading like a waterfall bowed respectfully before the rush burke the air was thick with anticipation as the rush burke cloaked in royal blue leaned in closer his voice a mere whisper lady syria she straightened meeting his gaze with unwavering resolve yes your grace Rush Burke stood with a concerned expression, his flowing robes rustling in the gentle breeze. Beside him, a figure serious stern, seemingly lost in thought. If you remain out on the terrace and your condition worsens, the Rush Burke warned, that meddlesome fiancé of yours is liable to make a scene and send for a high Syria turned slightly, a hint of a smile playing on their lips, and replied, my apologies, your grace. Escort this to the high church as soon as possible, Rush Burke commanded, his voice echoing through the marble chamber. Don't want any more tragedies in my palace. As he turned to leave, Syria with a hint of foreboding, but my grace. He might seem cold now. With the mysterious eyes, he stared at Syria and gave him reply that, but one day, soon he will be gazing at the saint with love-filled eyes that is the fate of the male lead Callus was not feeling while Syria was taking care of him in his room. Callus asked her, You once tried to remove my arm, my lady. What are you up to now? Syria, while doing bandage on his hand, replied, Top squirming Callus, I need to treat you. Callus asked, Where did you get those herbs? Syria was still busy in doing bandage to his arm with the aim that he might feel relaxed. So she replied from the cliffs before the church, this will allow you to use your arm again. Callus lay on his room's bed, his eyes wide with a mix of surprise and admiration as he listened to Syria's recount of her daring adventure. You mean you ventured out on the cliffs alone? He asked, his voice tinged with concern. That's right, she replied. And the main climax we will know in the story that Callus is the one who will kill Syria. But Syria Hart was in love with Callus. He was much possessive about Callus. While taking care of him with great love and respect, she was thinking in her heart, 
I have got to find a way to make him like me. But so it was only by pure coincidence. Honestly, what's brought on this change in you? He asked. He got up from his bed and started looking at Syria as if he had fallen in love with her. That the secondary male character fell in love with Syria in the process. Callus and Syria both spent their great time together. They both fell in love with each other. Suddenly one day, Callus proposed Syria with the ring. He was presenting a delicate ring adorned with a shimmering emerald. One of the two of us get married, Syria? He asked, his voice trembling with hope. Syria's eyes widened, her heart racing as she gazed at the man she had loved for so long. Since the original story ended with the main male and female characters falling in love, and Callus committing suicide in despair, I thought, this could be an improvement, yes, a perfect tweak to the storyline. Without me getting in their way, want their love story run smoother than it did in the novel? So I made a vow. I hope I would avoid getting tangled up with the two leads at all costs. She and the Duke will make a connection soon. I clearly promised myself, but a few days later, Syria and Line both will meet each other with love and respect. Lena introduced herself to Syria and Syria was also felt pleasure to met with Lena. Lena told Syria that she was waiting for a long to met her. Now the writer of the novel is confused here and said, what's going on here? I said, I did not want anything to do with them. Lena came to meet with Syria as she had been waiting for a long time to spend some time with her. Lena, with a radiant smile and a heart full of hope, stood amidst a field of golden flowers in front of Syria, her laughter echoing through the air. It's a bit embarrassing, she confessed, her cheeks flushing, but the rumors are true. I came from another world and became a saint. Her eyes sparkled with a mix of pride and humility. Syria replied, I have heard, my lady. However, Syria was not as happy to see Lena as she seemed. She was thinking in her heart, I've been trying everything I can to avoid this girl. She was just pretending to be happy to meet with her. In the grand, Opulent hall adorned with intricate blue and gold designs. Lady Syria stood in front of her. I heard your wedding dress fitting is today. Is that right? Lena asked, her voice filled with excitement. Yes, my lady, Syria replied softly, her eyes reflecting a mix of anticipation and anxiety. Now, Syria got exhausted after answering her questions. She thought, what the heck is she doing here? Lena was impressed with Syria's wedding dress, so she said, A wedding dress from another world. How fascinating. Everyone here wears such splendid gowns. I have been burning with curiosity. At the same moment, Syria heard the name of her fiancé from Lena. So, she was shocked and thought in her heart. Why are she and Callus already on a first-name basis? It took me 11 months to get him to let me call him by name. Looks like old habits die hard when it comes to the heart. Lena was wandering around the castle of Syria and called out, Oh, in Syria. Yes, my lady, Syria answered her with a great smile. Lena shared her wish. I did love to watch you change into your wedding dress. Syria thought in her heart. What does she want to watch me undress? That sounds a bit. But she replied, Pardon? Lena and Syria were busy talking with each other. Designer Begonia who was also one of the main villains in the story, was holding her diary furiously and called out to Lena, St. Lena, I do beg your pardon, but being fitted for one's matrimonial attire is not some sort of spectacle. Furthermore, the privilege of attending such a fitting is only extended to the bride's attendants, close relatives, and the most intimate of friends. As it stands, none of those classifications applied to you. Lena apologized, I am sorry, I still have not gotten used to the customs of this new world. Lena left the castle and said, well, then Syria until we meet again. After saying this, she left that place. Begonia was furiously staring at her at that moment. Still, things are definitely gonna be different this time around, right? And Callus fired designer Begonia from the castle for being rude to Lena. In a softly lit room adorned with delicate furnishings, Callus and Lena sat across from each other the air thick with unspoken tension. Syria, her green hair cascading over her shoulders, leaned forward slightly. Callus held a cup of tea, his posture rigid, as if bracing for the weight of her words. 
What do you mean you want to change designers? You must already be aware since you were there when it happened, he said, his voice a blend of accusation and sorrow. Saint Lena is someone who descended from the heavens, of course. She is completely different from the tainted nobles. You have got to be kidding me, Sirius said in response to him. Callus told her, even if that clothier was unable to understand the heart of a saint, to speak so harshly to another, it seems best to dismiss her. Syria thought for sure the story would change. She said to Callus, Begonia was merely telling her not to make a spectacle of me. From a noble's point of view, St. Lena's remarks were rather discourteous. Callus, while making her understand, said, But Lena was only Lena. On listening to this, Syria got shocked and became angry. Did you just call the saint by name in front of your betrothed? She did not like Lena's presence everywhere behind her and Callus. Callus apologized to Syria and said, That was a mistake on my part. Please be understanding, Syria. As for the clothier, it's just that I have been appointed as the saint's protector, so. Syria was tired of listening to this. She clenched her fist and thought, Even this is identical. In the original story, Lena's divine powers became highly unstable after she fell into this new world. The powers that be of the High Church appointed her a protector among the heads of the 17 houses that possess the power of the gods. Callus is the head of House Hannaton. Given that setup, the two of them naturally grew close pretty quickly. But Syria thought that would not happen now since Callus was engaged. On the other hand, Syria was upset after listening to Lena's name from his mouth. So Callus made her understand. Are you dismayed that I failed to mention my appointment as St. Lena's guardian? Maybe I've been too complacent, but if I get angry now... Syria, while bowing her head down in front of him, said, No, no. And then she passed a beautiful smile and said, Things may end just as terribly as they did in the book. I understand, Callus. I can't let myself just die like that. I'm going to do everything I can to stay alive this time around. Callus became happy after seeing that Syria was happy and understanding him. Syria's eyes were downcast, and her hands were clasped tightly in her lap. Callus, cloaked in a flowing white coat, leaned over her with concern etched on his face, whispering, What a relief. I was afraid you'd gotten upset. The warmth of his presence and the sincerity in his voice began to melt the icy wall she had built around her heart. Thank you for being so understanding, my beloved. Syria's heart was racing after hearing the word beloved from Callus' mouth. Callus, after wearing his coat, was about to leave Syria. He said to her, I am terribly sorry, Syria. Apparently, Lena's divine powers have run amok again. I must attend to her immediately. Syria became mad with anger as she did not like Callus meeting with Lena. She was very possessive about Callus. She was thinking in her heart, it has not even been a full day since you last said her name like that. You son of a bitch. Lady Syria went out from the castle for the inspection of the lake and it was much cold outside. Syria was thinking, it's so hard to be a good person. I think I got a rough idea as to why Syria lived as a villain. Elliot, who is the knight commander of House Burke, asked her, You look unwell, my lady. I have heard you have been suffering from a cold. It seems today's inspection of the glacier has overtaxed you. Syria replied, Not at all. This is something I must do. What are we talking about, you ask? Well, within House Burke's dominion, there rests an extraordinary mass of ice known as the Beast Tomb. House Burke is charged with periodically checking the barrier around the glacier to prevent the excellence of the monsters. And they require the power of the gods wielded by Stearns to do so. In the original story, Syria would occasionally put off going to the lake for inspections. Syria, beside the lake, told Elliot, If I want to solidify my position and survive this, then I have to properly carry out all of my duties as a Stern. Elliot gave her the idea that why don't we finish here for the day and head back? Shall we, Lady Syria? Elliot asked from Syria. Lady Syria stepped back and saw that Rush Burke reach their place. Rush asked Syria, What are you doing here? Syria was speechless and constantly staring at him. Elliot bowed his head in respect and said, Your grace to Rush Burke. Burke was very furious at Syria. 
So he exclaimed with rage, For pity's sake, Lady Syria, do you not hear me speaking to you? Lady Syria was constantly ignoring him and did not want to reply to him. On her act, Bert got mad in anger. Do you not hear me speaking to you? Lady Syria now smiled and said, Pardon. Then she asked, Did I do something wrong? Burke, with angry expressions, asked, What possible reason could you have for coming out to the lake in winter while afflicted with a cold? Lady Syria said, Thank you for your concern, but it is not severe, and this is something I can do as a stern. Rush asked with stern expressions, when did you begin taking your duties so seriously? Burke made her understand. It isn't this just an attempt to weaken your health even more so that you might catch your fiancé's attention? Elliot, standing at his back, marked his attention and said, Your grace. Syria further told me, I did not come here with any such intention, regardless of how sick I become. My back road will never cause a disturbance in your palace. Is it because of the saint? What is that supposed to mean? Is Lord Callus having a liaison with her? How could he say such a thing? Burke was silently listening to what she was saying. Then he asked Elliot, Have you finished with your inspection? Elliot replied, Yes, your grace. Then he praised Lady Syria's qualities. Thanks to Lady Syria's hard work, we were able to finish in short order. Truly, without her efforts, I would have taken half a day longer. Lady Syria thought in her heart, who does he think he is, acting all high and mighty? Elliot was supporting Syria, so Syria was thinking, Well, I suppose he is a male lead and damn handsome to boot. Why does he have to be such an asshole? Burke said to Elliot, Now, this time we have to return. And Elliot followed his command. Syria made eye contact with Burke. Burke, while taking healthy precautions about Stern's health, said, We must not allow our precious Stern's health to deteriorate any more than it has. Syria leaned towards him, noting how careful he was about Stern's health. Then he left that place after saying this. Syria was feeling much cold outside, but she was thinking, What is this for, after all those sharp remarks? On the other hand, Syria in her castle was thinking about Burke, did he like me more than I thought? Still, I did probably best to avoid him as much as possible. There is something about him. He is the scariest out of all of them, not to mention the way he talks. I just want the wedding to wrap up as soon as possible so I can get out of this place. There is only one reason why I am staying at House Burke's palace right now. Stearns are considered to be such holy figures within the empire that they can only take part in certain important rites such as the exchanging of wedding vows at a limited number of locations. One of those is House Burke's Dominion, which guards the frozen lake. She let out a deep sigh, her frustration evident as she muttered, stupid book. I wanted to avoid the wedding here at all cost, mostly because this is where Lena and Rush, the two main characters, get married at the end of the story. As it turns out, Lena is actually a stern too. Furthermore, Syria was making herself understand. I know she is the main character, but still, is not this a bit contrived? A saint and a stern. No wonder the original Syria was so jealous of her. Now, Syria stood up and stepped towards the palace, thinking, the fact that Lena is actually a stern is only revealed at the very end. If I just get married and then quietly make my exit, I should be fine. On the way to the castle, Abigail Obian, who was Syria's escort knight, saw Syria and came forward towards her. He said, My lady, in the heart of a snow-covered forest, green-haired Syria, with a look of concern and happiness after seeing her knight, asked, How was the beast expedition? Did you make it back in one piece? You were not injured, were you? Their words, filled with relief and care, echoed through the frosty air as Abigail softly urged, Please pause to take a breath, my lady. Syria whispered in his ears, glad to see Abigail in the palace. She asked while whispering, You did not kill anyone by any chance, did you? Abigail exclaimed with joy, I have told you, I never touch anyone but a criminal. Everything went well, though I did miss you when my armor turned as cold as ice, my lady. Syria replied, bowing her head down, I knew I should have gone along. One of the biggest reasons why this world required sterns is because armor is crafted using constellations of steel. These special armaments, 
known as Astral Armor, protect their wearers from being poisoned by magic. The knights who battle demonic beasts hold sterns in high esteem. Without their intervention, their body heat will be stolen away by prolonged contact with Astral Armor. Knight Abigail held Sirius' hoodie, exclaimed with happiness. We should hurry inside, he murmured, his voice tender with concern. You're liable to catch cold. Suddenly, Syria thought of Burke's words. We must not allow our precious Stern's health to deteriorate. She was lost in her thoughts. That's probably why Rush Burke was acting so concerned. For now, at least I am still the precious Stern. Abigail was noticing her as she was lost in her thoughts. At the same moment, Syria exclaimed with happiness. Let's go in, BB. I want to hear all about what happened. I did better solidify my usefulness somehow. Lena, while standing at her room's window, was staring at both of them. Her caretaker told, Lady Syria has changed a great deal this past year. She has become much closer to Marquis Henneton. Lena leaned towards her and asked, Why does Callus' fiancé visit the glacier every day? She is a stern. Only a stern can purify the lake's barrier. She is earning praise throughout the palace recently for her daily diligence in carrying out her duties. As Lena was jealous of Syria's powers, because she was gaining more respect in his palace due to her stern's powers, she can do what Lena can't do, having divine powers. She was constantly staring at both of them from her window. I envy her, she said. Her caretaker did not hear properly, so she said, pardon? But she made Lena understand this title, Stern, can I get it? You're already considered a saint, my lady. Lena, being jealous, but doesn't Stern sound more dashing? The glacier can only be purified using Stern's magic, so everyone in the palace is so interested in her. Even with my divine power, I can't do that. Lena was upset as she was in Burke's palace and did not gain the same respect as Syria had gained. But her caretaker made her understand Although you will, of course, have to learn all the proper forms of etiquette first. Besides, not just anyone can become one. They are all children with divine power who were born on Wednesdays in winter. Each of them has a star somewhere on their bodies, and the word Stearns are. Lena was upset as she was looking outside the window. She said, I am so envious. Lady Syria was not feeling well, so she was resting in her room. Her caretaker was taking care of her. She told Syria, your birthday is soon, Lady Syria. She was giving medicine to Syria as she was not feeling well. Here, for your cold, she gave her medicine. The wintry Wednesday, I mean. Syria, with joyful expressions. Ah, that is right. I've been so busy that I forgot. Syria Stern was born on a wintry Wednesday. A person must meet several conditions in order to be bestowed with such a title. A child born on Monday, has a lovely face. A child born on Tuesday is filled with God's grace. One of which is that they must have been born on a wintry Wednesday. A child born on Wednesday is full of sorrow, but a child born on Thursday brings with all the love of tomorrow. A child born on Friday shows others kindness and grace. In the original novel, Syria thought the lyrics to the rhyme were unfair when she heard them in the church. But after she awakened as a stern, she quickly fell in love with having a wintry Wednesday birthday. Syria officially became a stern on her 15th birthday, when the awakening of her spiritual powers was heralded by the appearance of a small star on her ivory neck. She immediately abandoned her family name, Keladin, and began proudly using her new title in its place. Because of that, her already poor relationship with her family grew even worse. So, this was all the story about how Syria became a stern. Her caretaker told Syria, In addition to my lady, the saint has continued to show great interest in Constellation Steel. It is becoming quite concerning. Is it not dangerous for her to get close to Constellation Steel before her powers have stabilized? She has such an inquisitive nature. Again, Syria lost in her thoughts. She was thinking, Lena and Constellation Steel? That's right, she has a tone of curiosity, just like you would expect from a typical female main character. Although she did awaken as a stern after touching a Constellation monolith, 
I should try not to worry about it too much. Once the wedding is over, I just need to go and live quietly in House Hannitin's dominion until the rest of the story plays out. At least, that is what I was planning to do, but I keep bumping into this guy. Syria pondered over a peculiar plant she had just discovered. Syria was looking at the green plant with great concern, as she thought, the green garden vault a few minutes earlier. It does not matter how many times I have seen these silver laurel boughs, they are still amazing. As she carefully examined its delicate leaves and vibrant petals, a whimsical thought crossed her mind. If a stern were to become a plant, wouldn't they look just like this one? Inspecting the glacier is not possible without it. The silver laurel, whose branches have the power to both strengthen and purify the barrier, is also used as a substitute by knights when a stern is not available. Suddenly, she got an idea as she smiled. Should I ask Bibi to come with me today? At the room, Rushberg appeared and asked Syria. You appear in quite high spirits, Lady Syria. Lady Syria bowed her head. Your grace, in respect of Rush Burke. While giving greetings, all her plants fell on the floor. So, she picked all the plants. Why did all these fall? Rush Burke stopped Syria from picking up the plants, as he wanted to pick all the plants from the floor. Syria was speechless, staring at his eyes, as he was showing love and respect for Syria. And he asked Syria, while picking up the plants. Are you visiting the frozen lake again today? She was lost in her thoughts, so again Rush asked, Lady Syria. She replied, Yes, yes, I am. He said to her, I'm not sure I understand. Lady Syria did not understand what he said. Pardon, she replied. Furthermore, he told Lady Syria, As far as I am aware, ample care has been taken with your chambers. Lady Syria asked, Do you still find them lacking? What is he talking about? He stood up and told her. Otherwise, it hardly seems necessary for you to inspect the glacier with such zeal. Is it your recent diligence because you want something? Actually, that is not exactly true. Every time you visit my palace, you run about shrieking whenever something is not to your liking. Our hundred servants were left bedridden after serving you, which means I must work even harder around here for the sake of those hundred people's past suffering. You really are quite the enigma. It may prove something of a pity when you leave for House Hannigan. Bert gave all the plants to Syria. Well, Syria was thinking, a pity to whom? To this guy? She leaned forward and started staring at his eyes, thinking, seriously, what's going on? Syria was sitting in the main hall room of the palace. Her servants informed her, my lady, your wedding presents have just arrived. Take a look at them all. Servant started showing her wedding gifts. This sapphire was sent by Marquis Hannitin himself. What clarity in the color so deep. But Syria was not taking any kind of interest in wedding surprises. She was still lost in thoughts and was remembering the word pity which Rush Burke said to her. She was looking at her reflection in the teacup and thought. Hearing the male lead say that feels like I have been given some sort of guarantee that I will make it through all days. It seems like I am miles away from that doomed ending. Now I can finally focus on the wedding. And after coming back from her thoughts, she received tea from her servant. Here, my lady, her servant gave her a cup of tea. I have also prepared the bracelet that you spoke of before. The servant said to Syria, giving her the bracelet. Syria was happy to have the bracelet. Callus has given me so much. I did like to return the favor by giving him something before the ceremony. Servants with great love and respect said, You are going to give that to Marquis Callis. Are you not, my lady? Oh my! How absolutely romantic! The other servant said to Syria. Syria was looking at the bracelet and said, Does not Lena discover a magic crystal mine in the original story? Until that happens, these are considered extremely precious gems. So, I'm sure he will like it. Suddenly, one lady came and called, Lady Syria, it is a catastrophe. The saint, Lady Lena, collapsed after touching the Constellation Steel Monument. Not only that, the monument itself turned transparent and began to shine. Syria leaned towards her and started sweating because these are all signs of the arrival of the new saint. Lady Lena was not in good condition. 
Syria also came to watch Lena's condition. Callus was holding Lena's hand as she was not feeling well. This does not make sense. We are still only in the early stages of the story. Lena's awakening as a stern definitely happened near the end, did it not? Rush Burke, cloaked in darkness, strides purposefully towards the two anxious attendants. His piercing gaze and commanding presence send shivers down their spines as he inquires, how is the saint's condition? The attendants exchange worried glances before one nervously responds, your grace, the lady beside him, her gown flowing like a river of silk, breathes a sigh of relief, her eyes reflecting gratitude. Fortunately, the worst is past, thanks to Marquis Hannatin's presence at her side. Syria was jealous of how Callus was holding her hand in his hands. She was thinking, come to think of it, Callus has not even noticed that I am here. Elliot said to Rush Burke, a new stern has appeared, your grace. Saint Lena will surely repay any kindness you bestow on her. Rush Burke was speechless at that moment. Rush Burke came across Syria as she was staring at Callus with jealousy because he was not giving attention to her. He asked, Lady Syria, were you always afflicted in such a way when you awakened as a stern? In response to this, Syria replied, No, no, your grace. My divine power is nowhere near as immense as hers. The effects a person experiences from constellation steel are directly proportional to the magnitude of their power. Rush Burke said, That means there is no way the saint was unaware of the fact that her body was overflowing with divine power. Yet she still insisted on touching constellation steel and causing such an uproar in my palace. His servants replied, Oh well. Furthermore, Rush Burke said, Perhaps she never entertained the possibility that she could be a stern. You are the one overseeing the saint's lessons. Are you not? Then tell me, why should she do such a thing? Lady Servant told Burke. Perhaps it was because she feels a vague sense of admiration for Lady Syria. Lady Syria got shocked that she is so important in Lena's eyes. She lost in thoughts? Lena for me? But why? Did she really touch it because she admires me? Or could it be that she wanted to check if she was a stern? Lady Servant apologized to him and said, This is all my fault, your grace. Excellent. You have some awareness at least. Bert provided a response on this. In the book, Lena accidentally came into contact with Constellation Steel. Her divine power burst forth with such force that it nearly killed her. But the truth of her being a stern was finally able to come to light. Then, does this mean she touched it on purpose this time, out of admiration for Syria? That is so different from the original. Suddenly, Lady Lena awakened, so Lenin, who is Rush Burke's chief aide, told them all that Lady Lena got awakened. Rush Burke leaned towards the outside of the room and exclaimed with happiness. Ah, good, let us be on our way then, Lenin said. Your grace, would it not be nice to at least look in on Dash? He stopped once stared at her eyes with anger and asked, do I look like the saint's nursemaid? Lenin made him understand. Still, at least for the sake of relationships with the high priest, please. But shall we go call on her together, Lady Syria? She's your fellow stern after all. Syria was speechless at that moment, as Lena opened her eyes, so she saw Callus in front of her. Callus was very worried about Lena, so when she opened her eyes, he became happy and said, Lena, have you awakened? Lena, in a half-conscious state, called Callus. It hurts so much. Callus made her understand. Don't worry, Lena. You will be fine. I am right here by your side. Abigail, who was standing behind Syria, whispered in her ears, Shall I cut off his hand? Syria was speechless, noticing how her fiancé was taking care of Lena. Burke informed Lenin that, as you are aware, the Burke estate is really busy in winter. I don't have the means to keep this nuisance in my palace any longer. Syria thought, while staring at Rush Burke, did he just call Lena a nuisance? Furthermore, Rush Burke ordered Lenin, send word to the high church that St. Lena will be returning there as soon as she's able to move. Lenin followed his command. Callus screamed at Rush Burke, is not that rather excessive? It is not as though it was her choice to become ill. After all, 
and calling an invalid a nuisance. Lena stopped Callus from shouting at Rush Burke. Rush Burke said, Can I not speak as I wish in my own palace? But Callus still screamed at him. Still, it's rather harsh. She is an invalid after all. Both of them were passing arguments against each other. It's good that you mentioned that. You keep using that word invalid. Your betrothed condition is also far from ideal. Aren't your priorities a bit skewed? People may mistake the saint as your fiancé. Callus called Syria as she was lost in her thoughts. She was thinking, I am not sure, but I feel like I am on the verge of tears. Instead of Lady Syria here, I am the one who should be angry at Callus for tending to another woman, not Rushburg. The way I have never allowed myself to get angry, even once, and just stood by quietly through everything, all for the sake of avoiding Syria's fate in the story. Rush Burke told Syria, This will be the first stern wedding ceremony we will have had in some time. We must keep such vows sacred. Syria was hurt as Callus was becoming more possessive for Lena day by day. She was thinking, It is embarrassing. I want to go home. I just want to live a peaceful life. Callus and Lena, I just want all of it too. Syria was lost in her thoughts as Burke forwarded his hand and said, my lady, Syria leaned towards her. He said, Shall we take our leave? The saint requires tranquility. He was insisting that Syria come along with him. Callus, while stopping her, was worried. Suddenly, Lena's health again broke down, and she was not feeling well. Callus was taking care of her. Callus said to Lena, Are you all right? Callus held Lena's hand in his hands and said, Come, my lady as Syria was not as happy to go with Burke. She was upset. She loved Callus by heart, but Callus was very possessive for Lena, and this thing was much hurting Syria. Syria was collecting some plants from the cupboard, and she was thinking of Callus' words, which he was saying to Lena, don't worry, Lena. You will be fine. I am here by your side. I have not heard a word since yesterday, that jerk. Suddenly, at that place, again, Rush Burke appeared as she saw Syria collecting plants from the cupboard. He entered the room and called Lady Syria. Lady Syria bowed her head in respect and said, Your Grace. He said, Shall we take our leave? After seeing Rush Burke, she felt lost in thoughts and remembered the words that Burke had said to her yesterday. The saint requires tranquility. Come to think of it, I never thanked him properly. Burke told Syria, My Lady, Will you be able to inspect the lake properly after what you went through yesterday? If you are using this inspection as a means of escape, then why not simply ensconce yourself in the annex instead? There is no need for your concern, your grace. I shall fulfill my duties as meticulously as ever. Syria passed a smile at him and said, I would never take a thing so lightly. I am a stern after all. Both of them were talking with each other and suddenly Callus noticed that they both were becoming close day by day. He was standing behind the wall and was staring at both of them. Syria, I've been wondering where you went, so this is where you were. Callus came across both of them, leaned towards Rush Burke, and asked, Am I visible to you? Burke saw him and exclaimed, Marquis Hannaton. Callus became rude when he saw Syria with Burke, so he apologized and said, Pardon my rudeness your grace. I could not find my betrothed anywhere. I have spent much of the day searching for her, but I was not expected to find the two of you here in such a secluded spot. Burke said to Syria that she can come along with him, but Syria was speechless as Callus was hurt from her side. Burke said to Callus, I do not recall even granting you permission to enter this vault. Are you unaware of the fact that no one aside from a stern may enter this place without my express approval as the Duke of the Palace. Callus, while making Rush Burke aware of his powers, told, I will gladly make restitution once I return to my own land. If you have a specific sum in mind, then Burke, after hearing this, became mad in anger. It is not for the likes of you to decide your own punishment. We will follow the rules of House Burke. Callus made fun of him and said, what do you mean by tradition? Rush Burke made her understand. One of your hands should be cleaved off at the wrist. He showed his hand to him and asked, What do you say?
Callus also passed a mysterious smile in response to this. I was not aware that you wanted my hand, your grace. Are you keen on a war to break out between our houses? Syria was silently watching them, as she was speechless and worried about what sort of conversation they both were having. It appears you are the one hungry for war, Marquis. Rush Burke said to Callus in an angry mood. Syria was very worried. Standing at the corner of the room, she was thinking, they did wage a war in winter just to prove their valor. Do they want anyone to freeze in winter together? Well, you two will not die. Your fighting spirits are blazing hot. If it is a war you crave, then Burke will gladly answer. With serious and stern expressions, Burke told Callus, Is it you who seeks this, not I, your grace? Very well, I have an urgent dispatch to send to your state. Immediately, Callus responded to him. Syria thought, an urgent dispatch. What is now happening? Syria stopped Burke from all of this. Your grace, my intended has been more discourteous, but would not waging a war over something this minor be cruel to the knights who are already responsible for minding the glacier in winter? Rush Burke with calm expressions replied to Syria, I entreat you. Syria again stopped him from taking any kind of negative orders that may harm people or the state. She said, your grace, Please show me the same benevolence that you have shown to this stern. Callus leaned toward Syria. He is much jealous of her betrothed and Burke's closeness. So he said, My betrothed will vow to never do anything so disrespectful again. Burke stopped Callus from thinking anything negative about Syria, as she is a very nice and kind stern. Syria exclaimed with happiness, Yes, crisis averted. Callus leaned toward Syria and with angry expressions, was staring at Syria. He said Syria a word, but Syria did not listen to him, and by ignoring Callus, she left the place. Callus tried to stop Syria and said, Stop Syria. I asked to speak with you. How can you run off on your own like this? You took hold of the Archduke's clothing so indiscreetly, and now you are behaving horribly and delicately, simply because you are angry. Syria was constantly ignoring Callus, but after listening to Callus, she screamed at him. You mean to say I'm the one whose behavior has been indelicate? Callus, while making her calm, responded, Please try to make yourself calm, Lady Syria. You know that Lino is ill. She is a delegate of the gods who has come to us from another worldly plane. She has no one to rely on but me. Callus tried to stop Syria and spoke in a harsh and rude behavior because Syria was not trying to understand him. Can't you understand that much at least? I am understanding, Syria replied in polite behavior. Callus was sharing feelings with her about how Syria is ignoring him for some days, as he noticed. Is this how you show it? Getting angry, spending time with another man, and no longer looking me in the eye. You did exactly the same with the saint. Those are two entirely different cases. Lena is being infirm. Syria, in response to him. Yes, they were different because I at least did not call the Archduke by name in front of my intended audience. Let go of my hand, as Callus was holding her hand. She was not happy with that, as Callus hurt her so much for the past few days, so she also ignored him. Callus said, Syria, listen for some time. Syria was very angry at Callus, so she snatched her hand so hard from his hands that blood started flowing from her hand and her hand became injured. I had enough of this. This pick is serious. She snatched her hand and injured her. Then she said, I told you to let go. Callus became shocked to see Syria's condition. How could you wrench your hand away like that? You have hit it against a tree. Syria, being hurt, replied. As I was you, Callus, I would have asked to break off our engagement and propose to St. Lena instead. Callus leaned toward Syria and said, What? How could you say it like that? As you were the one whom I loved, Syria clenched her fist and shared her emotions with him. Who would believe a man who fondly holds the hand of another woman in front of his beloved? Syria thought in her heart, I did not fall head over heels in love like the heroine of a romance novel, but I really did like Callus. You don't know anything, don't you realize? Syria said to him. Furthermore, she shared her feelings with Callus. How terrified I am. Every time I see you by her side. Callus, being worried as he hurt Lady Syria very badly, said, 
Syria, I didn't mean to make you cry. Furthermore, he apologized to her. I am sorry, Syria. Truly I am. Please stop crying. He made Syria happy and hugged her. This is all my fault. Syria was crying. Her tears melted Callus' heart. I will be leaving for our state as soon as the wedding is over. Once St. Lena recovers, I promise to never see her again. He held her hands into his hands and promised her. I vow to be a faithful husband to you, Sirius said, while being worried. Just make sure you are not late on our wedding day. Callus exclaimed with happiness. You have no reason to fret. I would never do such a thing. Syria also started smiling as Callus cleared her of all misunderstandings. Callus, in the novel originally, kills Syria and takes his own life after even that fails to win him Lena's love. We share similar fates, since the main character already has a happy ending laid out for them. Would it not be all right if the two of us enjoyed a bit of happiness too? The writer of the novel said, that was how I tried to rationalize it. I am so terrified that both Callus and Syria will be fated to die again. Everything will be worked out as I put my faith in Callus. After all, trusting him is the easiest way to prevent Syria's death. Callus and Lena set a meeting together in the room. Both of them decided that they will call each other by their names. Lena asked Callus, What are you trying to say? Callus replied, Today we will mark the last day we will call each other by our names. Lena bowed her head innocently and asked, Could this have something to do with your betrothed? To tell the truth, Viscount Eisen has already lectured me on this topic. Her eyes filled with tears as she was saying, I suppose this means we have to refer to each other as Marquis Hannetton and St. Lena. Callus made her understand. This is true, and it will be difficult for us to continue to meet after the wedding ceremony. Lena was not happy with Callus' decision, as she believed Callus as her true and dear friend. Callus was speechless. Lena shared her thought. If only we could have met one another sooner. Suddenly, Lena saw a silver shining bracelet in Callus' hands. So she asked Callus about the bracelet. Callus told her that this bracelet is gifted by Syria, and you are quite perceptive. Lena was constantly staring at the bracelet at Callus' hand. Furthermore, Callus shared her thoughts about Syria. I would like more than anything for Syria and I to become friends. It is a branch of etiquette to refer to someone who is not closer to their first name. Lena, on hearing this, became angry and screamed. Etiquettes, etiquettes. Then she shared what she was feeling. Have you any idea how much I am having to restrain myself? And now, Archduke Burke says I have to return to the high church. It is terrifying. It is so distressing to lose a dear friend like you. She started screaming at Callus. Do you know how much time my world has changed? You said you were my protector. Was all that a talk about taking care of me a lie? She sat on the floor and started crying as she was very hurt to lose Callus, because Callus is her only one dear friend. Furthermore, being in a weeping state, she said, you will never know how happy I was, but when I heard those words, Callus tried to stop her from crying and made her understand, Lena, please stop crying. I am sorry, no more tears. They both sat next to each other. Callus looked at Lena as she was worried and upset. He said, are you feeling a little calmer? Lena, being upset, tears were falling from her eyes. She said, Callus, I want to visit the glacier. Callus was shocked at why she is saying to visit the glacier. As a saint, her duties are different. He asked, the glacier? Whatever for? Lena told her, now I am stern. I will be able to help Syria with her duties. Won't that improve our relationship? Lena stood up and decided to help Syria. Callus made her understand that I can understand your feelings, but right now, your condition is. Callus, enough with the objections. I am going, even if I have to do it alone, Lena said with stern expressions. Callus was staring at her, as how she changed the tone of her voice. Very well, Callus said by standing up. Callus, while passing a smile at her, but we must make it quick. Lena and Callus both went outside. You have my word, Lena said. This really is the last time, Syria. You are telling me they left the premises. 
and now we have lost all word of them? Lenon replied, Yes, your grace. Apparently, all contact with Marquis Hannetton has been severed. It is believed they got caught up in a sudden blizzard and lost their bearings. Rush Burke clenched his fist as he became angry after hearing this. He must be out of his mind. He then leaned towards Lenon and asked, does he intend to allow Lady Syria to die? Lenin and Rush Burke were communicating with each other about Syria. Rush Burke was very possessive and careful about Syria. He said to Lenin, that Marquis, does he intend to allow Lady Syria to die? He must be stark raving mad. Lenin told him, Perhaps they simply met with disaster while out for a stroll, your grace. Saying that amounts to allowing Lady Syria to die is rather. Burke was much worried about Syria. There can be no simply when it comes to a Stern's wedding. It is not simply something that can be taken lightly. If any aspect concerning punctuality, the venue, or any of the other set rules is not properly observed. Lenin leaned towards him and said, Your Grace, the Stern's power will erupt. In the worst case scenario, she would die. Of course, that knave is fully aware of just how dangerous a Stern wedding is. And yet he still went out right before the ceremony? Should I have knocked him senseless and thrown him in the basil? Suddenly, Burke saw outside the window, and he saw Lady Syria there. He asked Lenin, what is Lady Syria doing out with the search party? Lenin told him, perhaps she wishes to accompany them out of concern for her intended. Burke noticed something about Syria. Concern? I have noticed how she has changed into a completely different person over the course of a year. Was it all because of love? Burke ordered Lenin to inform Lady Syria that she is not permitted to move out of the palace until her wedding ends. Lady Syria was in her room she was upset, standing behind the window. I can't leave, but I have to find Callus before the ceremony. As she was worried for Callus, because Callus was not seeing her anywhere, Abigail Oriel reached in her room, stepped forward towards her, and said, My lady. Syria told Abigail and shared her problem with him. BB, we were forced to halt the search for today. The closer we moved toward the glacier, the more the blizzard intensified. Abigail made her calm and said, we will recommence as soon as the glacier sun rises. His eyes filled with hope to see Callus in the marriage ceremony. I see he will be able to make it back, won't he? Abigail held her hand and made her understand with a message from Archduke Burke. My lady, Archduke Burke asked me to pass on a message to you. Syria asked, Archduke, what is it? Archduke conveyed a message to Syria that, you serve Lady Syria, do you not? Convey this message to her. Suddenly, Syria remembered Archduke's words, which he said to her before, I will get that wretch into the wedding hall, even if I have to hogtie him and toss him inside myself. Even if the day of the ceremony has come and you have yet to hear a word, continue your preparations as normal. No matter what may come to pass, your wedding will proceed as planned. Abigail, with disheveled hair, relayed a chilling message, his voice trembling as he spoke. That's what he wanted me to tell you. His face was absolutely terrifying as he talked. He said his eyes wide with fear. Syria shivered, recalling the terrifying expression that had accompanied the words. Syria, while looking outside the window, told him, the high church always spoke of punctuality. I don't know why, but apparently, it is extremely important when it comes to the ceremony. You need not be distressed. The Archduke will be joining the search himself. I have no doubt Callus will come back. I believe in him. Finally, the day of the stern wedding cake, and today it was the wedding of Syria. On the other hand, Callus wanted to leave Lena in a cottage room, but Lena was not happy and was saying to Callus not to leave her here in this place. You will not possibly leave me here alone on my own, would you? Callus was sweating as he was becoming late for the ceremony, so he made her understand, but there is hardly any time left before the ceremony. Lena shared with him an idea. Wouldn't it be all right to postpone it for a day or two? Besides, there is no way you did ever make it in time. Callus was furious on Lena as she was not understanding him. I am afraid that is not possible, not when it comes to stern nuptials. It cannot be postponed. Lena asked him to explain her all the situation. Callus, 
Can you not explain? Suddenly, at the same moment, Callus coughed at Lena's face, and a drop of blood fell on Lena's face. Callus urgently stopped coughing and put his hand on his mouth, but a lot of blood was coming out of his mouth, so he became worried, and it was a sign that a stern wedding has already begun. Two ladies working at the Burke's house were discussing about Syria's wedding. You mean to say Marquis Hannetton never returned? The other replied her, apparently, he is stranded. Surely, he did not run off with the saint. The wedding without a groom. What a humiliation for the stern. They both were whispering with each other about Syria's wedding. When on earth is Marquis Hannetton going to arrive? Surely he knows about what happens at these things. I just hope the rumors about him and St. Lena are not true. The other exclaimed with worriedness. That is not a problem right now, at this rate. She told her, Lady Syria's divine powers are going to explode. Lady Syria was dressed in a beautiful bride dress, her eyes reflecting the secrets of the universe. Clad in a gown woven from moonlight and shadows, she held a bouquet of roses that whispered tales of love and longing. Abigail suddenly listened to what the ladies were whispering about Syria's and Callus wedding. So he asked her with angry expressions, What did you just say? What is going to happen? Lady became worried after seeing Abigail's furious expressions. Lady Syria, draped in a flowing white gown, appeared on the grand stage. But after reaching there, suddenly she coughed, and a drop of blood came out to fall from her mouth. Now Syria was not feeling well. On seeing this condition of Syria, Abigail screamed with worriedness. Lady Syria, what's happening? The lady standing behind Abigail told him, No, you will not touch her. Abigail became furious at the lady as she held his hand so that he must not go towards Syria. Abigail wrenched his hand and said, Let me go. Her ladyship is. Lady told her, This is stern ceremony. If she is touched out of turn now, her divine power will become even more ensnarled. Only those who attended the committed ceremony may do so. Abigail said, When is Marquis Hannetton coming? Gather together all the stern insignia. I will use my own powers if I have to. And here I was thinking I did manage to avoid a terrible ending from the original story. Is this really how I die? Why? Because Syria is a villain. But I did not do anything to get in the main character's way. All I wanted was to live. What on earth did I do wrong? Constantly, Syria was facing blood vomiting. Her clothes were filled with blood, and her eyes filled with tears as she wanted to live, not to die. Suddenly, at the same moment, Rush Burke arrived at the church and stepped forward towards Syria. Lady told Rush Burke, Your Grace, you must not touch the stern. It appears we are all about to die. Do you expect to solve anything by standing about? Waiting? Syria's stern, a stone adorned in a gown sparkling with enchanted jewels, found herself in the arms of Rush Burke, cloaked in regal attire. The air shimmered with an unspoken promise as their eyes met, each holding secrets of their own. Rush Burke was very worried to see this bad condition of Syria. From Syria's mouth, blood was constantly coming. Rush Burke held her into his arms and said, Syria Stern, get hold of yourself. You cannot die. Wouldn't it be too unjust for you to perish this way? Lady Syria's eyes filled with tears as how Rush Burke was curious about her health. And even at that ceremony, Callus did not arrive at the wedding ceremony. Syria's condition became weird as the rules and regulations of the Stern's wedding are very strict. If the groom did not come to the wedding ceremony, then the divine powers of the bride's Stern exploded and she died. When Syria was doing blood vomiting, Suddenly at that moment, Burke arrived, held her into his hands, and said, Will not it be too unjust for you to perish this way? Syria's eyes were filled with tears as she did not want to die in this way. So she said to Burke, Dying like this would be much too painful, your grace. Blood was also flowing from her mouth. Burke became much worried, and her eyes filled with hope to see Syria alive. Suddenly, her arm flipped from Burke's shoulders and fell on the floor. That means Syria will die at the next moment very soon. Burke ordered the man in the church, prepare for a commitment ceremony at once. He asked, 
My grace, but what would that mean? Burke told him. The Stern's wedding will proceed as scheduled. Syria's Stern will be saved, but whatever means necessary. Syria was saved because Burke married her and saved her life. Now she was saved, sleeping in her room, and Burke was sitting behind her. She was dreaming, please don't kill me like this. I want to live. Spare me. I beg you. Suddenly, she opened her eyes, but her eyes were filled with tears. She was hearing in her dream that someone is calling her by name, Syria, Syria Stern. She opened her eyes and saw Burke, who was sitting behind her. Burke asked, are you awake? She replied, your grace. He checked her eyes that were filled with tears. I really cannot understand you, Lady Syria. What on earth was happening in your dream to make you weep so? Lady Syria asked. I was crying, Burke told her. You were crying in your dreams, so I awoke you from your dreams. Syria said that you were the one who was calling my name. Burke responded, yes, it is right. I was calling you by your name. And then he asked her, but what kind of dream were you dreaming? Syria told him, I was dying. Burke sat behind Syria on her bed and started putting a wet cloth on her head so that her temperature may become normal. Burke asked, are you afraid of dying? Syria replied, that is not everyone is afraid of death. Burke, while putting wet strips on her head, exclaimed with a smile on his face. Well, after all of your hell-raising antics, I had always assumed you did not fear such things. Her eyes wide with a mix of surprise and curiosity as she gazed at Burke beside her. The room was silent, save for the soft rustle of the curtains swaying in the gentle breeze. Syria was speechless, but suddenly she remembered about Callus and asked him, and what about Callus? He became speechless and started putting wet strips on her head. Syria became worried why he is not telling anything about Callus. So she stopped Burke for putting wet strips on her head and said, what are you doing? Burke made her aware of her condition that at this moment she is having amnesia. But then he asked her, do you really not remember anything? What transpired during the ceremony? Then he told all the things about what happened yesterday at the church. Therefore, I commanded the head of House Burke, Arch Rush Burke, to swear an eternal oath to Syria Stern, the recipient of the constellation's blessings. Syria, with a curious yet hopeful expression, turned to the Burke beside her and asked, Are we husband and wife? Your grace? Her voice was soft. Burke told her, Indeed, the head of House Burke could not suffer the disgrace of losing a Stern. Syria was shocked that now she is the wife of Rush Burke, so she asked, Then does that mean you were aware I could die? Before the ceremony, I mean, Burke replied, Yes, I was aware of all the consequences of the ceremony. He stood up from the chair and said, Stern weddings are extremely strict affairs. In order to prepare for the worst possible scenario, it's customary for them to remain unaware of such a possibility. But their intentions are always informed as it is they would also be in danger if the ceremony were interrupted since the Stern's divine power would become ensnarled. Syria leaned towards him and, with a shocked state, asked, Are you saying that Callus already knew that I could die if he was late for the ceremony? He replied, Yes. Callus came back to the Burke's house, and after knowing that his betrothed is married to another man, he was shocked. He came to Syria's room, and in a shocked state, he called her name Syria. Syria was standing behind the window in her room, and with tired eyes, she looked at him. The lady workers informed Callus. The Archduke stated that no one is to enter Lady Syria's bedchambers without his permission. Syria ordered them, please leave us. I have something to discuss with Marquis Hanadin. Callus, being worried and upset, asked Syria, how could you, Syria? How could you marry another man? An Archduke Burke of all people, the callous voice trembled, a mix of disbelief and sorrow echoing in the silence. He grabbed her shoulder, but as Syria was very angry at him, she clenched her fist and slapped him on his face and made it clear to him how much he hurt her. She told him, it was because of you that I did not come. Marrying another man was entirely your doing, Callus. If it had not been for the Archduke, I would have died a horrible, agonizing death because of you. She was screaming at Callus, 
and Callus' face became red after he was slapped by the hands of Syria. Furthermore, Syria told him, From the look on your face, you are wondering how I know that. You knew that I would die if you were late, and yet you still. She came close to Callus. Her eyes were filled with tears as she made him aware of the reality. Ah, or was it that you actually wanted me to die? Is that why you went strolling about with Lena? Callus suddenly cried as he wanted to tell her that yesterday his luck was bad. Syria, please. We ran into misfortune. He sat on the floor at her feet and told her, I did not choose not to come. I was worried sick about you. Even in the face of our raging blizzard, I tried everything I could to get to you, but then suddenly lost consciousness in front of the door. His eyes filled with tears, and he was looking at Syria with crying eyes. He told her, You know you are the only woman I have ever wanted to marry. Every declaration I have made to you has come from the heart. He took Syria's hand into his hands and proposed to her, I love you truly, I do. Syria's heart melted for a moment. But suddenly she realized now she is the wife of Archduke, not Callus. Syria thought in her heart, what is this power? More importantly, how is Callus still alive? His own power should have exploded like mine did as the price for breaking his oath. No, it can't be. Callus had already taken part in a ceremony in which he had pledged to marry Stern. It bound him to Stern's in general, meaning he could theoretically marry any one of them. He had found himself in a situation in which the commitment ceremony time and place had all been properly arranged. In the dim glow of the moonlit room, Callus knelt before Syria. He gently clasped Syria's hand. The air was thick with unspoken words, as the light streaming through the window cast a soft halo around them. Callus told her, not to mention, but there is already another stern in this state. Syria exclaimed angrily, did you? Did you marry Lena? As Syria was shocked to hear that Callus had married Lena, Callus stood up and made her understand the situation. Syria, I am guessing you must have since you were still alive. Just because I want to avoid the original Syria's fate does not mean I want to feel this miserable. It has not been long since I first fell in love with you, but I regret wasting even that much time, Syria, being in a hurt state, replied to him. She started crying as Callus cheated her and left her to die in their wedding ceremony. She was expressing her feelings. I suddenly have the sinking feeling that all those moments I spent walking on eggshells trying to please Callus. She was constantly crying. Callus told her, It is nothing but a temporary marriage, but just like how you temporarily married Archduke in order to survive. She started screaming at Callus with wet eyes. And is that important? And all that time I spent playing the part of the charming, docile fiancé, it might have been leading me to another kind of ruin. Callus, his voice a mix of resolve and vulnerability, extended his hand towards Syria, whose eyes reflected a storm of emotions. Let us both get divorced and start over, he proposed, the words hanging in the air like a fragile promise. All we have to do is to go back to the beginning. There is still time, Callus said to her. Syria, feeling less for him, said, Time? Is time really all that we need? My feelings for you have already disappeared. Callus, with a determined stride, approached, their footsteps echoing ominously. The plea, please, let's discuss this. Hung in the air, a desperate attempt to bridge the chasm of misunderstanding. He was trying to stop Syria as Syria did not want to listen to his any kind of excuse. Suddenly, he grabbed Syria's hand in order to make her stop. He said, let go, Syria. I can sense another Stern's power emanating from you. Syria wrenched her hand and told him, it's quite repulsive, so I did like it if you stopped touching me. At that place, suddenly Archduke arrived and he saw that Callus was holding Syria's hand and pleasing her, but Syria was not listening to him. He told Callus, she told you to unhand her. He became furious with Callus and said, Are you deaf now as well, Marquis Hannadin? On listening to this, Callus released her hand and became mad in anger, as in which sense Archduke talked with him. Archduke, after seeing that Syria's hand is wounded, said, Your wound has reopened. Syria, being in a worried state, replied, 
Yes, slightly. But this wound pain was nothing in front of the pain which Callus had given to her heart. Archduke, while comforting her, more than slightly, we should send for a priest to treat you. Callus, with sandy hair, declared, I shall take Syria to the priest myself, your grace. His voice echoed with resolve as he gently held the hand at his chest. His eyes filled with a mix of hope and uncertainty. Syria and Archduke both were staring at Callus about how he is becoming careful for Syria now. Archduke asked Callus, why you? The two of us were in the midst of a discussion, so Lady Syria ought to be the one who makes that decision. Who would you like to accompany you? Syria, with the eyes filled with hope, was looking towards Archduke instead of Callus. Suddenly, she clasped Archduke's arm in front of Callus, and while looking towards Archduke, she exclaimed with a smile, It seems I am beholden to you, your grace. Archduke, with a smile, asked, Beholden? In the grand hall of a dimly lit palace, Syria and Archduke walked side by side, their footsteps echoing softly against the marble floor. Draped in a deep red cloak, Archduke leaned slightly towards Syria, whose green hair shimmered in the ethereal light streaming through the tall windows. As they moved forward, Archduke glanced up, his eyes reflecting a mixture of amusement and curiosity, and asked, isn't such language rather excessive between spouses? His words hung in the air, a gentle reminder of the playful banter that often colored their enduring companionship. While Callus was staring at both of them, but was not happy to see Syria with Archduke as he loved her too much, Archduke ordered Lenin, Lenin, summon a priest to my study. Lenin followed his command and replied, Yes, your grace. Callus was speechless staring at both of them. The priest reached Archduke's room and said to Lady Syria, Please refrain from any vigorous moments for the time being, Lady Syria. I shall take my leave. Syria and Archduke both were sitting in the cushion. Archduke asked, Do you feel better? Syria, while holding her hand, stared at Archduke and became speechless. Again, Archduke said by staring at her, Are you not going to say something? Syria stood up and knelt at his feet, bowed her head, and said, I know it is rather belated, but thank you for saving me, your grace. Archduke stood up and said, What are you doing? Did you sustain a head injury as well? He made Syria stand from the floor. Syria replied, No, my head is fine. Archduke, with striking silver hair and a deep red coat, reached out gently, his eyes searching for answers as he asked, then what is this? Syria, her long green hair cascading over her shoulders, looked back with a hint of vulnerability, her words hanging in the air. Well, I've only now come back to myself, so thank you for saving me. I owe my life to the main lead, the person I thought was the scariest character in the story. I am truly grateful. After all, he wagered his first marriage in order to save me. I will do everything in my power to repay the kindness you have shown me. The first marriage of the sole Archduke of the Jeru Empire. As Archduke was speechless and constantly staring at her eyes. Furthermore, she said to him, Please don't be too concerned, your grace. I shall do my best not to undermine your marriage prospects. Then Archduke asked, What do you mean by marriage prospects? Archduke stood contemplatively his expression softening as Syria, with flowing green hair, spoke earnestly to him. He said to her, the first time a woman has ever shown concern for those before. Even if you want to marry two or three times, regardless of the number, you did still set ladies' hearts aflame, your grace, Syria said to Archduke. Archduke, being slightly furious on her, do you view me as some sort of lecher? Syria, while making him understand, said, No, not at all. He smiled and looked at Syria. No, Syria was speechless, staring at his eyes. Then she said, I hope you won't be offended if I say, I intended to do my utmost as a stern for the sake of this estate, for however long our marriage may last. Archduke became speechless, staring at her eyes. Then he asked, Why are you studying my reactions so intently? Are you afraid of me? Syria exclaimed with happiness. 
I would not have said that. Although the way you were presented in the story was pretty terrifying. Archduke expressed her feelings, looked at Syria's eyes, and said, In any case, hearing that you will do your best for the sake of House Burke fills me with anticipation. Syria made him understand, I will do whatever I can. I live up to your expectations, your grace. This part ends here. Thank you for watching till the end. It took a lot of time and energy to make these kinds of videos, so please subscribe to my channel to watch more interesting Manwa stories.